Hey, pilots of the virtual sky, I would like to welcome you to my very first YouTube publication and my very first tutorial flight. Today, I would like to have a full flight from cold and dark and three goals on today's flight. Number one, perhaps give you a little perspective on the difference between sim flying and commercial flying. Some of the uh, differences that I've noticed over watching some of these tutorials. Also, to give you a little, number two, give you a little background of the history of some of the procedures and uh, the reason why some of the procedures are, are implemented. And number three, try to look at the flight from a passenger perspective. Right now we're looking at the beautiful 737-900 Ultimate Zebo Mod in U.S. Air livery. This is a fictitious livery. Actually, U.S. Air was a real live airline back in the 70s. They perhaps did fly 737s, I imagine, the 200 model, but they never had the 900 model as this is. They certainly never had that beautiful uh, little bump right there on the upper surface, which allows us to uh, transmit our ACARS information and allows the cabin to have in-flight entertainment and access to the internet. So here we are at KPDX Class C Charlie Airspace in Portland, Oregon, between Portland and Troutville, Oregon. If we were to look off to our immediate east, we would see in the distance there's Mount Hood, part of the Cascade Mountain chain. Out to our west, you can't see it from here, but about 60 miles west is the uh, Columbia River discharges into the Pacific Ocean. Right ahead of us, that's due north. That is the Columbia River. That far bank over there is Washington State. The river divides Oregon from Washington. There's a small community called Battleground over there. One of our first fixes we'll be using for navigation is BTG, the Battleground VOR. We're going to be on it right away. So that uh, that's our plan. Our flight today is due north. Battleground, continuing on to SEA Seattle, then PAE, that's Payne Field, Everett, Snohomish County Airport. That's where Boeing builds the wide bodies, 677787 models. And then on from there into Vancouver, British Columbia, our destination is CYVR with the alternate of CYXX which is about 30 miles east of Vancouver. It's a former Canadian Air Force base located in the town of Abbotsford. Abbotsford is not used for commercial aviation today, but it is does have 10,000 foot uh, runways that were built for big bombers. So if we have an emergency, it's a great place to set down. A little bit about me, I'm a private pilot with instrument training. I hold an FAA dispatch certificate. I've never actually worked as a dispatcher, but I'm comfortable with commercial operations. And that's why I'm hoping my insight can give a little bit something to this tutorial. And the first thing I notice about a lot of tutorials is right away, the hop right onto the flight deck. And my question is, well, how the heck did you get on the flight deck? And the answer here in North America, off in a big airport, is by jetway. This is default scenery. This is the default PDX airport. We are using the Orbix region scenery for the Pacific Northwest, but both KPDX and CYVR are default scenery with the SAM World Airways jetways. And I've quickly become a fan of these jetways. Anywhere you have a default airway, airport, you can now have a working jetway. Up here in the upper right corner, notice this uppercase white M on the blue background. We're going to click on that. It gives us our jetway control, and we're going to get our jetways moving in manual mode. There is an automated mode but you gotta flick a light switch on the flight deck to operate it. And how did you get on the flight deck unless you had an attached jetway? So we'll use manual mode. Not only is it more realistic, but it gives us a bit of eye candy. One thing as the jetway is attaching, it's gonna automatically open up that forward entry door. But almost as soon as I, I say that I wanna be realistic, what do I do but pop in the airplane onto the flight deck, you can hear the jetway working. And I wanna to go to the doors page and we can watch the entry door open, but I also wanna open the 
forward cargo door and the aft cargo door and let the baggage folks get a chance to load their bags. They're just popped open. Now, those doors aren't going to open without hydraulics, so we're going to give them hydraulics here real fast. So we're going to go to the upper panel, turn on the battery switch, closed the shielded guard. The battery switch will come on. Just below that, you'll notice an illuminated switch that says ground power available. We are going to be using the APU, but just like in real life, we don't want to burn our own fuel using the APU unnecessarily. So we're going to hold off on turning on the APU until it's really needed. For the time being, we're going to be on ground power. Flip that switch down. First thing to do is turn on the position light outside. That lets any ground personnel know that there's activity on this airplane. Watch out, things might be moving. And next is inside the interior exit lights. Our cabin crew has just come aboard. Might be a little dark in there. Have those exit lights illuminated in case anybody needs to get out of the cabin. And right away, turn on the fasten seatbelt lights. We're going to be boarding our passengers real fast. Uh, in a real life, the, one of the longest procedures in, in the, uh, getting on the way is getting the passengers loaded up. So we're going to uh, respect that by boarding them pretty fast. So here, up on electric hydraulic panel, we're going to get the hydraulics going. And right away... I'm going to move down to our flap lever and I'm going to move the flaps down into the takeoff configuration, five degrees of flaps. And the reason I do that, while we're doing the onboard pre-flight checks, our pilot not flying is downstairs outside the airplane doing the outside checks. And if the hydraulics are on the system, he can check for leaks. He can also, uh, if their flaps are extended partially, he can check for any binding uh, any misalignment. Also, we don't want those flaps to be extended right on top of him or on top of anyone else. So we're going to extend them right away so that there are no surprises later on. Now, the second longest procedure in the startup is getting the IRS aligned. So we're going to go to the very top of the overhead to these IRS aligned knobs and take the first knob, first to align, pause, then over to nav, second dial, align, pause, then over to nav, and then go directly above those knobs to this dial, the lower portion, the big portion, spin that around clockwise, and you'll get the numeral 8. And that numeral 8 tells me it'll be oh, now 7, 7 minutes in the alignment process. While I'm up here, I'm going to turn on the speakers for my VOR number one radio. I'm also going to turn on the speakers for my marker beacon. While I'm flying, I want every navigational advantage I can get. And I want to have every VOR arrow pointed where it should be. I want to, to identify the Morse identifier, identify the stations. I want to hear that outer, middle, and inner markers. And to do that, I need those speakers turned on. Come down here to the FMC. We will acknowledge that our onboard information is out of date. Go to the position initiation screen. Here's our last known IRS position. The airplane could have been moved in for maintenance into the hangar, could have been at a different gate, we don't know. And not too many decades ago, there was no such thing as GPS. And Pilots depended on that IRS, and they would use that last position. Today, we're fortunate our airplane does not only have one onboard GPS. We'll go to the next page. It's got two of them. So just here to the left-hand side, we're going to select one that moves down into the scratch pad. Then we go previous page. Anytime you see these empty blocks, that's required information. The dashes are nice to have, but you don't necessarily need them. So we're going to take this GPS cord, uh, position, plug it in, and you can see it's significantly different than the last position. It's a good thing we went down there and we grabbed those numbers. So on to our route. We are departing KPDX.
to CYVR. All airports in the lower 48 states start out with the prefix K. Alaska and Hawaii use the prefix P as in Papa. And Canadian airports use the letter C as in Charlie. So we CYVR is our primary. CYXX is our alternate. We do have a company route. I, earlier today, I went onto a free program called SimBreach. If you don't have it or haven't toyed around it, it's wonderful. It's free. It has great flight planning on it. And we could go through the time of entering in our waypoints along our route, but that's all been done for us by SimBrief. So I'm going to, I, I developed an OPP or an operational plan. I clicked and dragged that plan into outputs, uh, X-Plane outputs flight plans, and now I can type in KPDX CYVR. O1 is a reference number, and it should come up as a company flight as a company route. There it is. Activate and execute. Let's look at the legs page and let's look at our route. So we're going to take off from PDX. Our first waypoint is going to be that VOR BTG. That's in Battleground, Washington. It's right over the river. It's only nine miles away. We're going to be there real fast. Next to the Alder, SEA is the Seattle Vortec, uh, right at the, pretty close to the Seattle airport. It's a little bit north of the runways. PAE is Payne Field, Snohomish County, Everett, Washington. And that's as far as the flight planning as I'm going to do. Uh, we don't know what the winds are going to be like. We don't know what the active runways are going to be like up in Canada. So what I'm going to go is to go to the DPAR, our departure arrival page. We're going to pick out a departure for KPDX. And we don't know our departure runway yet. So we'll leave this blank. Um, but we're going to actually plan for a different destination initially. Uh, every flight, uh, uh, the pilot flying will often choose an emergency to brief. Now he could choose a tire blowout or he could choose a control service not working. He could choose lost communications. But today my emergency brief is going to be um, uh, aborted takeoff. And any time you fly a flight to anywhere, you want to assume that you might be in an aborted takeoff situation. What that means is you're on the runway, you're rolling down the runway, but before you get to V2, V2 is commitment speed, you have had a problem. Well, if, you, if the problem happens before V2, you're on the brakes right away, you're going to stop your aircraft on the pavement. If that problem develops after V2, there are two different scenarios. If you quickly lose the ability to fly to gain altitude, you're going to choose a place straight ahead. Maybe a farmer's field, maybe the Columbia River, maybe you'll do a, a Captain Sully. If you're able to climb at all, it would be best if you could get up to pattern altitude, come back and do an approach and land, on the runway that you took off from. Some people might be inclined to do what's called a button hook and to immediately turn around and land on the runway they just took off from in the opposite direction. Really bad idea. It takes the Chuck Yeager of pilots to pull it off. So best is to climb to pattern altitude, do a downwind, do a base, and come in for a landing on the same runway that you took off from. So in preparation from that, before we plan to go to Vancouver, we're going to plan a landing in Portland. And what I like to do is to choose an ILS, which is the easiest type of approach. We probably won't actually fly the ILS or engage the automatic systems, but to have that available in our uh, displays for reference uh, is a very, very good idea. You, you, you know, you're going to want to keep your eyeballs outside the airplane as much as possible, but for the small amount of time that you're looking inside, you want information that you can really use. So let's plan on an emergency landing to runway 28 right. That is a 
westerly pointing runway and it's the one closest to the Columbia River. So when I look out the windscreen and I look straight down, we're going to be parallel to the Columbia River. Great visual situational awareness to 28 right. Now, here are some SIDs, uh, uh, standard instrument departures. They're all very complex. Of course, right now we're, we're planning our departure. Um, I know that our first waypoint, remember, is Battleground, BTG. It's very close. So I'm going to choose PTLD Portland 1. And the reason I choose Portland 1 is because it's not a complex departure. Basically, what when you choose Portland 1, all you're doing is you're telling the controller that you want radar vectors. So you're going to take off, release yourself from the surly bonds of Earth, maintain runway heading, and when you're established on runway heading, you're going to get a, a vector in the general direction of new, due north. That'll point you toward battleground, and it'll get you on your way. Now, I'm going to, I'll tell you a dirty little secret about commercial aviation. This is so true, it's unbelievable. Um, you go through all the effort to plan your uh, SIDs and your flight route and your STARS, your standard uh, pro, uh, arrival, and all that work that you planned, all those waypoints, they mean absolutely nothing. From on a short flight like this especially, but even in a longer flight, often you are going to be under radar vectors from takeoff to touchdown. You will never get a chance, unless you specifically ask to fly your approach. And even then, you'll never get approved for it. But you never fly your actual planned route. You are on vectors the whole way. We do want to file a plan, and we do want to enter a plan in so that while we're flying, we have a reference to where we're going. Remember, if we were to lose radio communication, the controller is going to expect two things out of us. He's going to expect us to follow the last instruction given. He's going to expect us to be on our filed flight plan. But barring that radio failure, we're going to be on vectors the whole way. So vectors north to BTG, and that's what Portland 1 says. So we'll execute that. We'll go to our legs page, and sure enough, just before battleground, you get that nasty word vector. And here I'm going to dial out a little bit on the range, and you can see there's, there's battleground, and then there's that line that continues our route to Alder and Seattle. I'm going to go into plan view, and you can look at, there's battleground, there's a big gap, and there's, uh, there's battleground, there's the gap. Notice the line on the left leads out to infinity, and then it's, the route starts out at battleground, and then continues on to Alder, Seattle, Payne, that's our route. Well, that line to infinity, the computer doesn't know where the vector is going to be, so we're going to get rid of that in the, in the, uh, in the computer. So let's go ahead and select Battleground. It'll move to the scratch pad there at the bottom and right over the word vector go ahead and push that button and boom! Vector is gone. We'll push execute and on our display now we have a clean line straight to Battleground and straight to Alder and Seattle and Payne. Isn't that magic? Okay. <clears throat> But we want to set now. I'm not going to program the return to Portland into the flight management system because getting ourselves established in pattern altitude is pretty simple. And but what I want to do is set up the radios and set up the MCP as if we're coming immediately back to Portland uh, Airport. So let's go to the home screen. By the way, you know, silly me, I mentioned we wanted to get those passengers on right away. Let's turn on the air conditioning, provide a good cabin environment for our passengers, and let's make sure our parking brake is set. It is. Make sure ground services, we have our chalks under the wheel tires, that is. 
Now you probably noticed on a commercial flight when you're walking aboard, the airplane might shimmy a little bit, might bounce up and down. We sure don't want to have any uh, problem between the jet bridge and the airplane. So chocks are on and we will start our flight leg. Let the passengers board and not too distant that cabin atmosphere will cool down and they will be in comfort. Okay, so let's go to the Abbey tab. Wonderful Zebo mod has these options. And I'm going to choose Airport KPDX. We have a field elevation of 23 feet and ATIS frequency is 128.35. That's recorded information of a routine nature. We want to listen to that to get our pressure settings for our altimeter. And we'll also want to get an idea of the runways in use. And we can tab down a little further. And we notice that there are six runways here. Two of them don't have ILS as well. In an emergency, we're going to be given whatever runway we want. And we want to run, uh, we want a long runway. Here on the, you can see the runway lengths. We want a long runway and we want a runway with an ILS. And remember that visual reference off the Columbia River. I want 28 right. So that's the one I'm going to choose with the ILS frequency of 111.3 and a course of 284. Let's get that dialed in. Notice that there are two radios, one on the pilot flying side and one on the pilot not flying side. There's actually four radios here. Let me introduce you to them. The two radios on the top are comm radios. Radio, this is called radio one, the radio nearest to the pilot flying. And the active frequency is the one that we're communicating on. The Standby frequency is the one we're either just finished communicating on or the one we're going to be competing, communicating on next. And between them is a flip-flop switch. You can flip-flop between the two. Portland INTL information. There's the recorded information. We'll get to listen to it in just a bit. Over here on the non-pilot side is a second radio. And the great thing about the aviation world is it's often common to listen to two radios at the same time. You can imagine trying to tune in a ball game on one station and listen to classic country music on the other. In the real world, that might not be a, a real life. But in aviation, you very many times will have a, a real live controller on one radio while you're listening to recorded information on another one. So those are the comm radios. And just below that are the nav radios. And they have the same flip-flop. So 11.3 in the standby, we're going to flip it to the active. And you need to have both sides have that ILS frequency. You can hear by the Morse code that I'm already starting to receive that, the dot, dish, dot of uh, Morse code. And also both course settings left and right on the MCP. Those are required for an automated landing. And I'm going to use a lot of automation, and I'm going to tell you why a little later on. I know some pilots will poo-poo that, but uh, to me, uh, I like it, and I'll tell you why. Um, okay, so we've got our ILS set up for a return in case we need it. Let's go to the rest of our performance information. Here's our route. Now, on the sim brief that I've done earlier, I have it pulled up on a different monitor. I can tell that our sim brief takeoff of zero fuel weight is 130.6. And let's see if this close, the zero fuel weight here, if we click on this button, it should be close to 130.6, 129.4. That's not too far, I'm gonna leave it be. I think I have a little bit more payload in the uh, sim brief plan, but that's close. Notice also our, our Ideal flight level here in the upper right corner came in as 260. I've planned this for flight level 240, which is a little bit lower than 
than uh, per, than most economical. 2.2 is a good number for a realistic 737 in the reserves. We want to be, the law says you need enough fuel to fly to your primary, then to fly to your alternate, and then to have 45 minutes of fuel on an IFR flight plan. If you are flying visual rules, that would be a 30 minute limit. You can see by our fuel load here on the uh, EFIS display, E-F-I-S, that we have nothing in the center tank and we've got about 13,000 uh, pounds in the wing tanks. That's about an hour and 25 minutes worth of flight time, which I believe does satisfy the legal limit. We're going to be okay. Cost index, uh, this can be any number from 40 to about a, uh, 180. Uh, 85 is a little on the high side. Um, an airline, your airline will determine this. I used to use 100 a lot. I like to, to be a little less efficient and, and get there a little faster. So 85 is a little on the high side. This uh, basically is a number that the computer uses to, uh, to uh, give you the efficiency that the company might desire. Here's a place where you can enter your winds aloft the wind direction, the speed, the temperatures. If we were flying higher, I had that information available from Sinbrief, I could plug it in. This flight is too quick and too low. I'm not gonna worry about winds aloft. Outside air temperature, right here at the top of the EFIS panel, upper left-hand side, we can see it's positive 15 degrees Celsius. So we can go slash one five. You can also double click on this and it'll enter it in. Uh, we always want to use a D-rated takeoff on a big airport like Portland. This is Class C airspace. Class B airspace is the biggest, like Seattle or Los Angeles or Boston. But Class C airspace is controlled, and uh, it's a big airport. I believe Vancouver is also Class C. So you're almost always going to have a D-rate, not only for noise abatement, and of course that's a big reason, but also it extends engine life. But I want to get a, a maximum performance climb, so I'm going to choose a climb up here, and it's going to that's going to ask a lot of our engines. We've already set in our takeoff flaps is five. I'm going to let the airplane determine our center of gravity. It gives us a trim number of 4.77. Here's our trim wheel. By default, we're set at five. I'm going to spin this back. Four and three quarters is about 4.75. So 4.77 is probably right about there. We are going to acknowledge the V speeds by clicking them here. Most important V speed is V2 here at the bottom, 146. And it's so important that that's the speed I'm going to set into our MCP, our upper panel. And that's going to tell the computer or v-speed remember that's the takeoff rejection speed we want to have access to that okay time to let the cabin crew know that we're getting pretty close to ladies and gentlemen we'll be taking off in just a few minutes flight attendants please prepare the cabin for departure be on our way it also gets them started in their safety briefings i kind of like to hey, eavesdrop on that a little bit one thing we didn't do and we need to do is to file a flight plan. Now in real life, you would get this flight plan filed long ago, either on your cell phone or back at the dispatch office. Now that flight attendant right behind us, she just closed the cabin entry door. If you haven't heard all the voice packs, what I would recommend doing is do this. Um, go to that entry door and turn this little knob right there and it will open that door. I'm not going to do it because I'm not sure I'll be able to close it once I've opened it. But uh, at least for your first couple of flights, open that door and listen to the flight attendants and it will really kick up your immersion level and remind you that you've got people in the back. Okay, so we'll select delivery for our clearance 
usually you'd have your flight plan already filed and delivery is where you would get it. U.S. Airways, U.S. Air Flight 43, PDX to CVR. I've asked for a transition altitude to 12,000 feet. I'm not going to get it. Uh, usually you won't get a transition out above 10,000 feet. I like to ask for 12,000 because I know once I'm above 10,000 feet, I lose that 250 knot speed limit and I can fly a little faster. 240 on the cruise, 1,500 feet per second on the descent, and we want to give those controllers an idea of our descent performance. Um, you ever go to like a big airport like Chicago O'Hare and you're standing out at the end of the runway and you can watch all the planes on landing approach and you can see their landing lights and the, the nearby airplane is pretty low and the next one is a little higher up and you can see his landing light and there's the, the next one beyond that, he's higher up and there's a string of planes all waiting to land, all coming into land and they're all set equidistant apart. Well, in aviation that's referred to as a pearl necklace and the air traffic controllers, they want to have a perfect pearl necklace of airplanes using the approach using the limited amount of concrete runway for the most amount of planes being very efficient and they're going to want you to maintain speed and maintain descent rate fairly uh, aggressively. You know, in a flight simulator environment, we might tend to fly our approaches a little slow. In real life, they're going to want you to keep your speed up and keep your descent on profile. So we've given them that profile and um, that was the reason it was asked. We are going to go on to APU. This will allow us to unplug from ground power. It's very common to fire up the spool up the engines during the pushback. One thing that impresses the hell out of me now, I've pushed the APU start. I'm going to push the one and two fuel pumps. Our, our APU does need some fuel. Watch the exhaust gas temperature gauge, EGT gauge, climb and then descend and eventually this APU gen available light is going to illuminate and we're going to be able to transfer electrical power from the APU onto what's called the bus and the bus is where the airplane gets its electrical power and we'll be able to go off with ground power and unplug. That APU will also provide high pressure air for our engine spool up later on. So there it is, the lights come on, we're transfer onto the bus. Later on, when we get the engine spooled up, we're gonna come back to this panel and we're gonna transfer power from the APU onto the aircraft by using these outer switches. And then once we're in Canada, uh, after we get off the runway, we're gonna fire up the APU again, and again, transfer power from the engines back onto the bus and uh, use the onboard uh, APU power. Now, if you didn't have an APU, a lot of older 737s don't have an APU. Here on the tablet, on ground services, the GPU Connect. This is a little cart that provides electrical power. And also there's an ASU, a puffer cart, providing air pressure. But you would have to start both engines before pushback to use those carts. So we're gonna take advantage of the APU. We have our people are getting pretty far along in the boarding process. I'm going to turn on the windscreen heat. As we climb, we might get a little fog or a little ice, a little frost on our windscreens, and this heated windscreen will prevent that. Right below this, this puts heat on some outside probes. Temperature, or a TAT probe, a temperature probe, a PDOT probe, a, a PDO probe, and a AOA or angle of attack probe. We're not going to turn that on while we're at the gate. Those probes can get kind of hot and we've got ground personnel working around them. So we're going to wait until we're off the gate to get that get those fired up. We are on APU so we can hit the yaw damper switch. We have hydraulics. We have air conditioning on. Time to get our clearance. We are going to request our IR Portland clearance ISDL from delivery. delivery. Good afternoon. U.S. Air Fortree request IFR clearance to Vancouver as filed. 
U.S. Air 4 tree, cleared to Vancouver via runway 21 departure. Initial altitude 8,000 feet. Squawk 2300. Cleared to Charlie Yankee Victor Romeo via runway 21 departure. Initial altitude 8,000 feet. Squawk 2300, U.S. Air 4 tree. U.S. Air 4 tree, read back correct. Contact ground on 1 tree 2 decimal 275 when ready for start up. Couple of things about the transponder code. If we're in VFR flight, the code is always in North America, 1200. And that lets the controllers know that he's you're not his responsibility. You're in VFR, visual flight rules. Anytime you're on an IFR flight, you're going to be given a specific code. And what I'd like to do is to uh, give you a little... Uh, there's a couple of extra codes that you probably should be familiar with. They are codes 7600 and 7700. 7600 is loss of communications. If we lose our radio, we're going to tune in 7600. On the controller's screen, it's going to blink brightly, letting him know we no longer have a radio, and we're going to follow our last assigned instruction or our pre-planned flight plan. Now, the way I remember 7600, I think back to the pile of Patriot days and uh, one if by land and two if by sea, 1776, uh, the old court, uh, lighthouse, courthouse. And so what that tells me is communication 7600, spirit of 76, communication. The other code is 7700, that's the hijack code. And the way I remember that, I think about those old airport movies. Airport 70 and 73 and 75 and 77 and 79. Well, I always imagine that Airport 77, I don't know if it's true, but I imagine it was a hijack situation. So 7700 helps me remember hijack. 7600 helps me remember um, uh, communication, uh, radio. Now, one of the bad habits that you can get when you're assigned a frequency, you could dial it in from left to right, 2300. Let me admonish you not to do that. Start with either the last two digits, in this case, 00, or the uh, second digit, and tune that one in first. And the reason why is because that second digit might already be a 6 or a 7 from a previous flight. And if you start dialing, and 00, of course, is what all VFR flights use when they're tuned to 1200. So when you're spinning around that first dial and you've got 600 or 700 already in there, you could inadvertently pass through 7600 or 7700 and you're going to set off the air traffic control world. All their screens are going to blink brightly and they're going to think that there's some major emergency. So prevent yourself from scrolling through those frequencies by getting in the habit of tuning in those, those lower digits uh, first. Okay, we are getting close to push, push back. Let's close our doors, get our tug all set for the pushback, and get our jetway disconnected. So here's our jetway control, and as we disconnect the jetway, they're going to be kind enough to close that door automatically, thankfully. Oh, look at that. They've all been closed for us. That's nice. We want to go to ground services. Better pushback is a wonderful add-on. It's free and it gives a, a the, the reason why the immersion level is so high is, is you can watch the tug in operation. You can watch the uh, you can pre-plan your route on a very dynamically visible uh, screen. You can see I've been at PDX before, so I have a previous 
uh, tug position. Use your scroll wheel on your mouse to find the ideal position. And as long as the symbol is yellow, you're in a good position for pushback. If it turns red, you need to keep scrolling. But we got a night, we're right on the yellow line. So I'm going to choose enter. And that will be our Sound of cockpit plan acknowledged. Plan. Call me through the menu when you are ready. We want to go to our ground frequency and request push Portland back and start up. ITL ground. U.S. Air Force Tree request start up. Ground to cockpit. Tow is driving up. U.S. Air Force Tree start up and push back approved. You remember that our first destination is not Canada, but it's this airport and a nearby runway, a runway with an ILS. We've been assigned runway 21, doesn't have an ILS, but we're gonna land, if we need to, we're gonna land an ILS runway. And one thing we wanna always have is a decision height. Usually a published decision height is 200 feet above uh, AGL or above ground level. And here, that information can be put right here on our primary flight display. Notice I've this left hand dial next to the MCP. I've spun this around to the barrel position to the far clockwise okay. position. Okay, all doors and hatches are closed. Ready to connect. Up and push back approved. US and Airport then I've used the smaller dial to move that smaller number from 200 up to 223. Our elevation is 23 feet, you remember. There it is. So 223 on the decision height. Just in case we lose visual reference to the ground during landing. Of course, depending on how bad the emergency is, we, we may be landing there anyway. <laughs> okay, did she say break off? I think she did. So connected and bypass pin inserted. Release parking brake. Oh, there she goes. Break off. <laughs> Hit that break a little earlier. And you may start engine. She didn't like that. <laughs> okay, to get the engine started, we're going to need every ounce of pressurized air that we can get. And a big draw from that is the air conditioning packs. So our first step is to turn off the air conditioning packs, monitor this gauge just above them. We're going to go to dual bleed, and you're going to see this gauge very quickly and precipitously rise. In some of the more modern Boeing jets, you don't actually need to turn off the air conditioning. But in the 737 you do. We're gonna go ahead and turn on the rest. Now our wing tanks are full. We don't have any fuel in the center line tanks. So we'll leave those turned off. We're going to select the number two engine or the right-hand engine, turn the dial to the ground position. We should notice right away the start valve open becomes illuminated and we're looking for the low oil pressure light to become unilluminated, go out. And we're also looking for an N2 level of about 20, 20 there it goes. Those two happen simultaneously. Reach down below the throttle pedestal, our number two fuel cutoff. Hit the number two fuel cutoff and we're gonna feed fuel to that number two engine. Then we're gonna come up here, toggle over to the number one engine. Again, ground position, same thing down here. Start valve open, went on right away. We're looking for low oil pressure light to go out. We're looking for 20 on the N2. Got it almost immediately. You can get that air conditioning on, isolation valve on, get rid of the dual uh, lead. Now that we're away from the gate, we can turn on operation our complete. Go ahead and set the parking brake. Turn on that pedo heat. Disconnecting hill. Stand by. And we're going to transfer our electrical power from the APU onto the aircraft by hitting these outside switches. Now, the APU generator is available, but we don't need any more. We'll reach down here and we'll turn it off. Thank you, APU. You have provided admirable service. We're going to acknowledge the 
pulling on the landing gear pins, even though I don't see the landing gear. I know that tug is still right below us. We want to keep these lights on. We don't want to turn on the strobe until we're at the runway threshold. That's especially important. So is disconnected and bypass pin has been removed. Hand signal on the right. We'll see you next time and have a safe flight. Once that tug is pulled out from below us, this is especially true at night, hold off on turning on your runway taxi lights and your runway turnoff lights. There goes the tug. Thank you, tug. And what I like to do is I like to keep the takeoff reference on one side, one FMC, and then on the other side, I like to pull up the legs page. Now again, uh, we're not going to be flying the legs. We're going to be given a vector, and unfortunately, we're going to be flying that vector for the entire length of the flight, just like in real life. Busy air corridor, we're going to have vectors from start to finish. But we'll always have that that flight plan as a guide. Portland INTL Brown. Good afternoon. U.S. Air Force Tree is ready for taxi. U.S. Air Force Tree, taxi to runway 21. Contact tower on 123 decimal 750 when on holding point. Taxi to runway 21. Contact tower on 123 decimal 750 when on holding point. U.S. Air Force Tree. I took a moment and I spun up our flight altitude, our takeoff altitude is 23 feet. These are in increments of 50 feet, so 23 is the closest, zero is the closest. Uh, 24, flight level 240 for our in-flight altitude. What that's going to do is give us a cabin, a continuous cabin pressure of about 6,000 feet. Now 6,000 feet is not sea level. Have you ever heard a doctor or a dentist tell you that you really shouldn't be flying because you just had surgery. And the reason he does that is because he knows an airplane is not at sea level. It has a cabin pressure of about six or 7,000 feet. That's about halfway up one of these Cascade Mountains. That's pretty high. And that's called a compromise altitude. Now, we they could engineer a way in pumping the cabin full of pressure and having that altitude at sea level all the time. But we don't do that. And there's two reasons. First reason is it takes engine power, which takes fuel to provide that extra air pressure to keep the pressure at sea level. And airlines are cheap. They don't want to burn extra fuel. So they're going to have that compromise altitude. Second reason is every time a, an airplane cycles, or take, takes off and lands, that's called a cycle, the body of the skin expands and contracts. And over the airplane's lifetime, this expansion and contraction, just like bending a spoon, it can create weak points and create a structural failure. Well, by limiting the pressure on the inside of the plane, it limits that expansion and helps extend the life of the airframe. Now take a look at these taxi markers. Uh, here on our uh, immediate left-hand side, there's I'll tell you something my flight instructor used to talk about. Uh, whenever you see the black square, here you can see E2 is in the black square. And remember this memory mnemonic. Black square means I am there. Uh, if you ever see, uh, let's say it's very foggy, the ground controller doesn't know where you are, the TCAS isn't working. Uh, you can tell the controller, I am at E2, and he'll know right where you're at, because the black square, there's only one E2 on the whole airport that's in a black square like that. Now, the yellow marking is a crossing marking. We're crossing taxiway E. Uh, taxiways take you to where you want to go. So just ahead of us, that's taxiway E to the left and to the right. And the red markings are, of course, runway markings. Down here by the transponder, while we were sitting in the code, you may have not noticed, I spun the style a little bit. Usually it's in standby mode. I did not spin it all the way to the 
counterclockwise all the way to the right. I took it to the second notch from the right. And that's TA, and I don't see it here in the display. But what that allows, that allows the ground controller to see our position, but it doesn't emit harmful uh, uh, radio frequencies to ground personnel while we're at the gate. Now that we've moved away from the gate, I can move it over to its full clockwise position. It's a traffic reporting position, and that does emit not only to controllers, but to other aircraft. And uh, the TCAS in the modern world of crowded skies has become very important. We're going to use our heading display. Notice at the top of the heading display, the number three, you know, see TFC in blue, that's our TCAS. 30 and then 33 there on the right hand side. Remember, we're, we're taking off from runway 21, 210 magnetic. So US ideally, Contact tower you want to have 210 have real nice close to that heading when you're taking off. Put yourself in that position. Here's something that I really like about this ATC program. Did you notice how the controller he knew that we were approaching the whole short line and he transferred us from ground control to tower control even Contact before we got one, two, three, there. Decimal, seven, uh, five, zero. Have US you ever Air been like trade. at a busy airport? This is, I think this is the, the utmost in professionalism when a, a pilot, he'll start one engine during the pushback, he'll leave the other engine off. And all during the taxi, let's say he's 27th in line, he won't start that second engine until he moves up to num space number three or number four. And that saves life on the engine. Uh, very professional in my opinion. You don't need both engines to taxi around, especially if you're gonna spend a long time waiting to get into position. Another thing is pilots who can do all their switchology and all their procedures all done before they get to the whole short line, they can contact the tower, they can get their takeoff clearance, and they can go directly from the tarmac right into the takeoff roll. Very professional. This is called an ILS whole short line. You see the blinking yellow lights? Uh, if you see a line, actually this is a VFR whole short line two solid lines and two sets of dash lines mean don't cross that line without permission and an ILS or line might even be a little bit closer but you really don't want to cross the ILS line because if you cross that line you might be blocking the line of sight between ground based radio transmitters to approaching aircraft and those transmitters are broadcasting glide slope and localizer information to the landing aircraft. So if you're a little bit too nudged up too far, that landing aircraft, he may lose that critical glide slope and localizer guidance that he's depending on. Uh, stay short of the whole short lines until you're cleared. We are gonna get ready for our takeoff here. We are gonna go into what I call Christmas tree mode. We're gonna turn our strobes on we want to light every light in the house. Landing gear lights on. We're going to move our engine dials to continuous firing. Get a good burn during our takeoff roll. We want to, we already flipped the GCAS. We want to, we, we should have earlier, probably should have earlier flipped up our flight directors. That doesn't matter so much. We wanted to hold off on flipping up this uh, armed auto throttle. And the reason is, if there's a, malfunction in the auto throttle and the engines are running, it is possible you could accidentally go into takeoff go around mode or to toga mode before you actually intend to. And you could crash into a building or crash into vehicles and people and it would be a not a pretty sight. So when you're out here near the runway, then you can go into auto throttle mode and uh, RTO on the rejected takeoff in case we need those brakes, in case we get to V2 and we need to stop suddenly. Five degrees on the flaps and 
We've got our takeoff configuration. Let's call for our clearance. On to the runway. On to takeoff. Portland INTL Tower. Good afternoon. U.S. Air Force Tree on holding point of runway 21. Ready for departure. U.S. Air Force Tree. Wind is calm. Runway 21. Cleared for takeoff. You ever watch those movies like The Right Stuff or Apollo 13? And when the spacecraft is just leaving the platform, you'll always hear the uh, astronaut Approaching saying, two, one. The clock is operating. Well, from the earliest days of aviation, it's always been a policy to start the clock, the onboard clock, just at takeoff. And what this does, it gives you a reference to the takeoff time it helps you calculate performance and most importantly fuel burn so uh, from the earliest days of aviation even if you're in a little Cessna you always want to start the clock just before takeoff here in the upper right corner is the start switch you can see it there get it lined up on the runway and we can hit our toga takeoff go around switch and the great thing, it's uh, here at this little mic button here on the dash. On runway, two, one. That is going one. to give us our D rate. Remember, we put that D rate in the flight computer. We're getting a takeoff configuration warning. I don't see a reason for that. 80 knots. Is this this far into the flight? I'm going to ignore it. Ha, 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 ha. a real flight. You might want to pay attention to that. <laughs> Rotate. The first couple hundred feet of the ground is what's called ground effect. You get an artificial lift oh, that goes away pretty fast. So you want to concentrate on your climb attitude. When you get positive rate, gear can come up. You can take away the first notch of flaps. Maintain runway heading. Cleared for takeoff runway 21. U.S. 1, Air Force Tree. U.S. Air Force Tree. Altimeter 29 or decimal 86. Contact Seattle Center on 127 decimal 050. But. Altimeter 29 or decimal 86. Contact Seattle Center on 127 decimal 050. Goodbye. U.S. Air Force Tree. Seattle Center, good afternoon. U.S. Air Force Tree passing 2,200 feet, climbing 8,000 feet. U.S. Air Force Tree, turn right heading 352, climb to 8,000 feet. Turn right heading tree 52, climb to 8,000 feet, U.S. Air Force Tree. We were immediately vectored to the north, that's exactly what I expected. We engaged above 400 feet, we engaged our Command A autopilot and it automatically engaged our heading select whatever number we put in here that was our first vector we were given to head us north and also our level change which established us on our initial altitude we can go ahead lose a little bit more flaps notice there's a couple of tape bars here the tape bar on the left is our speed tape bar the red marks are the never exceed speed we'll get real close to that and here on the right is the altimeter tape monitor our climb and on the bottom is our magnetic track tape monitor that as well so it's basically four five instruments all in one attitude indicator here in the middle, airspeed indicator, 
on the right, on the left, altimeter on the right, heading indicator at the bottom, and a navigation instrument in these little dots along the edge when you're using that for navigation. Going to our other display panel, you can see BTG Battleground, our first waypoint. Again, we're not following our established uh, path. We are being vectored, and we're going to be vectored the whole way. I, you know, this is a, a very frustrating go. thing. Take all that time and energy to make up the perfect flight plan, and you're vectored from start to finish. <laughs> but it's so true in today's aviation. We're going to be vectored the whole way. Okay, we have made our transition altitude. In real life, you're often given your cruise altitude clearance just before you get to transition altitude. We didn't get that, but we're, we're now at our transition altitude. So, and we need to stay at 250 or below. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into ATC and I'm gonna request that we get our cruise altitude. ATC dialog box. Flight two or level two four zero. You can also uh, declare an emergency here, or you can cancel IFR. Seattle Center, request cruise altitude changed to flight level two four zero. U.S. Air Force Three. U.S. Air Force Three, climb flight level two four zero. Climb flight level 240, U.S. Air Force Tree. Notice I turned the brake control from RTO, projected takeoff. I turned it over to MAX, and we're going to be using the MAX for our landing, at least initially. Many times during the rollout, I will downgrade that or maybe even turn it off depending on how the reverse thrusts are operating. But I always want to start out at max. As a Navy, uh, in naval aviation, you always want to use as little runway as reasonably possible. Now again, our goal is a comfortable ride for our uh, riders in the back, but you always want to position yourself as far back on the runway before the takeoff roll. Sometimes there's an available, what's called displaced threshold. Displaced threshold is an area of concrete before the runway. It can be used for the takeoff uh, roll. It cannot be used for landing, but you always want to use that if it's available. There's almost nothing more wasteful than unused runway behind you. So uh, have the maximum amount of runway available but use the minimum amount, amount that, you, that you need. Pretty soon, the cabin attendants are going to be giving their climbing introduction. I'm going to give a couple of bings on the attendant call button. That lets them know we're above 10,000 feet. They're able to get out of their seats. They're able to pass out the peanuts. They're able to um, talk about all those good credit card offers. And the onboard entertainment should now come alive. The onboard internet and the onboard uh, entertainment should be available. We are also above 10,000 feet. The continuous fire on the engines can come off and we can come out of Christmas tree mode. On engine power, I thought I hit the off button to the APU. Seems I didn't toggle it in the right direction, so we've got the APU coming off. We need for it until we land. I'll tell you why. You know, one thing that you never see modeled on other tutorials is as soon as someone lands, they reach up and turn on the APU. Why did you turn on the APU? Well, you're going to be heading to the gate and you're going to want to, passengers are going to want to get off as quickly as possible. So you, you want to get the engine shut down, especially the engine on the left-hand side. So as soon as the chocks are under the tires, as soon as the brakes 
are uh, put in park. You're going to hit that seatbelt sign. The jet bridge is going to engage. That uh, front door is going to, or you're going to want to open it, but that engine's still running. So you're going to want to shut off that engine or both engines, but you're not going to want to lose onboard electrical power, at least for a couple of minutes. So you get that APU fired up, you transfer the power onto the bus, and that way you can safely shut off the engines without having to necessarily wait until you're parked and settled at the gate. 18,000 feet is where we change from pressure altitude. We actually got it at 2986 was what we were given by the controller before we took off. And I didn't put it in the primary flight display here at the lower right corner. You will see it up here in the secondary or backup uh, attitude indicator. Even after we cross into standard pressure, at 18,000 feet, we're going to go on to standard pressure 2992 inches of mercury. That way, if a plane is coming in from Tokyo or coming in from New York, everybody's at the same flight level uh, at 18,000 feet. I still want to have that local pressure tuned in to my backup altimeter. And again, if this whole display is go bluey, we might be depending on that. So there's our little. over to standard pressure on the non-pilot side. Pilot not flying side. We're doing a good job of paralleling our course. One thing I like to do, I mentioned it earlier, is I like to get every navigation error arrow working in my favor. So I'm going to toggle the map on. Here you can see we departed from one runway 21 there at the bottom. We made that rather dramatic vector heading north. And here we are into Washington State, looking well ahead of us, that big monster airport. There's SeaTac Airport, and the one next to it is Boeing Field. Uh, Boeing used to build B-17 bombers during World War II right there. They also do a lot of air, airplane tests. Uh, but we want to fly in a couple of navigation fixes that we don't already have established. One here directly ahead of us is TCM. TCM is Tacoma VOR. It's at a U.S. Air Force Base, a joint base, McCord Lewis. So we're going to, here in the lower right hand corner of the screen, you can see we hit the two nav one button, and that'll tune our nav one radio into TCM. And then we want another one. How about here on the ocean to our far left is HQM. HQM is Hoquiam. We'll tune NAV2 to that. And we'll get rid of our map. And here just to the right of our primary display, you're going to see our radio magnetic indicators. And now we have two arrows. Uh, these arrows, uh, one of them, the VOR1, the one to Tacoma, there's no information coming out of that one. And the number one, the, the thin little arrow is horizontal. And the horizontal means we're not getting anything from it. Either that or you're absolutely horizontal. Oh, there it kicked in. Now TCM has kicked in. We're 49 miles from it. It's right ahead of us. And you might have noticed the swing of the arrowhead at the top of that primary uh, VOR to go into TCM. The other one, the big fat arrow, that's VOR2 to Hoquiam. We're 72 miles from Hoquiam. It's kind of amazing that we're further away from Hoquiam, and yet we were able to get that one when we were not able to initially get uh, Tacoma, by the way. You know, I just figured out why we had that takeoff configuration alarm. Notice the speed brake arm indication up here. There is a little arm located right on our throttle pedestal called speed brakes. And what this does, it controls small panels on the top of the wing that create extra drag on the airframe. And we have been flying with a little bit of speed brakes, speed brakes engaged that whole time. And that's why we got that takeoff configuration warning. 
Okay, we are well above 18, uh, 10,000. We can kick up our speed. I'm going to go from 250. I'm going to go to 350. Not snow. As we're climbing, the molecules in the air, the air is becoming less dense, which means there's less distance, about 320. Uh, there's less distance between the air molecules and the combustion engine works more efficiently, we burn fuel better, and also we can uh, progress faster. So here we have a airspeed, true airspeed calculated at 384, indicated airspeed of 270 and climbing uh, on our speed tape. And our ground speed is 391 and climbing. Eventually, we're going to reach a point where we are at our established indicated airspeed, and the airspeed is not moving. But the ground speed will continue to climb, and that's because as we climb, uh, we are as at a higher altitude, uh, we can go faster. I don't know if any of that made sense. <laughs> Maybe I should. Maybe I should engage brain before engaging mouth. <laughs> okay, we're getting, we got Alder, we got Seattle, we got Payne. We still don't have anything beyond Payne, and we're not being given anything beyond Payne. So I'm going to do something that pilots will often do, and I'm going to pretend, I'm going to assume a clearance. Now, again, we can change anything, but I want to always have some type of reference to what's going on around us. We already have those couple of VOR needles moving in our favor. And I can listen to Tacoma with its Morse code in the background. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to select an approach. I know I know YVR Airport pretty well. And two of the runways are right off of water. And as much as the winds will allow, the controllers will try to set you up for an approach over water again for noise abatement reasons. So we're going to go to our DPAR departure arrival screen. We're going to select out CYVR arrival and we're going to choose a runway that has a, a from the west arrival. So from the west pointing east we've got ILS 08 and ILS 0, uh, left. I always want to choose an ILS approach if it's available. This airport has plenty of them. So the first one is ILS 08 right. I'm going to go ahead and select that one. And again, here we've got a whole list of stars, and these are very complicated. You have to do a little bit of research. Uh, but one thing I want to um, insufficient fuel. Oh no, <laughs> that is not good. How did we get insufficient fuel? Okay, well, you did not see this from me. I thought I'd done pretty good fuel planning. I'm going to go up into our flight configuration. Do what I say, don't do what I do. I'm going to go into our flight configuration and by the magic of flight simulator, we're going to give ourselves a little bit more fuel. Maybe I was talking too much on the tarmac. So we shouldn't have insufficient fuel now. So these approaches are pretty complex, but uh, one thing, PAE is our last known fix, and I would love to get an approach for runway 8 right that uses PLA, PAE in its transition. When we choose booth 1, there's no PAE, so let's erase that. Let's go back and press that. Canuck 4, press that. No PAE transition. Uh, press that again. Go to col column 2, no PAE. Press that again. Go to Go Talk 4, no PAE. There's a whole, there's three pages of approaches. If we didn't reach one, we, we could keep going. Grizzly 5, look at that. There's METAL and there's PAE. So, what this means is when we get to the end of our pre planned route at PAE, it's going to bleed directly on to our approach for one runway 8 right. And I'm going to push and execute and it immediately finished off our route. So let's look at our legs. I'm going to turn this 
left dial to the plan page and zoom out just a little bit so we can look at the waypoints. By the way, we're coming upon Alder, but remember, we're not actually flying the route. We're a little bit off of Alder because we're working on vectors. So the airplane might not know, they didn't know that we're at Alder. We're now probably heading to Seattle. So I'm gonna move Seattle a little bit higher up in the pecking order. Let's put SEA into the scratch pad and then click it right here under BTG. U.S. Air Portree, turn right heading 002. Turn right heading 002, U.S. Air Portree. And when we're in plan mode, this little dial on the left, all the way clockwise, now there's a little button that says step. We can step through each of our waypoints and see our route. We can examine our route. So there's BTG, or there's PAE, there's Pain, Bezoff, Egret, and I can tell right now. Look at this magenta line that goes off into infinity off to the west. Well, you and I know exactly what that is. We've already run into it before. That's that nasty vector line. TATGO, YVR, another example of a VOR that's not on the airport. Uh, NAMU, and then vector. Let's get rid of that vector. Let's choose Google in the scratch pad and right where vector goes. Execute. And there goes that nasty line. Let's zoom in a little bit and see what we're going to be doing here. Now notice we're going to be flying a downwind leg heading west to NACMA, then a 90 degree turn to Bugla, and then another uh, base leg, and then an, another 90 degree turn on the final to our easterly ILS approach. And the airplane can easily do that, an experienced pilot can easily do that. But let's say you're just starting out and let's say you want a, a little bit of extra time for planning. So what I would like to suggest is do this. Uh, let's create an artificial waypoint out here just to the west of Ubla. And that might give you a little bit more time to get yourself established on the approach, a little bit more time to pick up those frequencies. And the way we do that, we're gonna make a, a artificial. Notice the inbound radio, the inbound course is 083, so I'm going to select that inbound uh, waypoint, and then I'm going to find the reciprocal. I'm going to add or subtract 180 degrees to that. In this case, add. Easy way to do that is to add 200 and then subtract 20. So 183 plus 200 is 283, minus 20 is 263. I'm going to type in 263. That's the reciprocal of 83, put a slash, and I'm going to give us an extra five miles. And that'll give us a little more time for thinking. And I'm going to put it right there at Google. So now we've got Google, we've got a discontinuity next week. I'm going to grab Google, US scratch Air pad. Tree. Descent to flight level 150. to let the folks know that we are descending. It was a real short flight. We didn't get a chance to do a level off brief. We didn't get a chance to turn off the seatbelt sign. Flight level one. And you know, in an hour long US flight, that's often how it's going to be anyway. Tree. Turn left heading 344. Turn left heading 344. U.S. Air Force Tree.
but I will let them know that we are in the descent. Actually, I hit the wrong button. I had meant to hit the initial descent announcement here on the middle right. I'll hit it now. And then when we get to our next step down below 10,000 feet, that's when I want to go to my prepare for landing announcement. By the way, I'm not sure if you've ever been introduced to these. These are different voice packs. Uh, right now we're using a number 11, which is a Delta voice pack. Ryan, Ryan, Tui Fly, German. These One, will often announce which airline two, they are associated three, with. Four, United, United, Southwest, Southwest 2, American Air, American Airline, Delta 1, Ryan, Ryan, 2, 1, but if you have a U.S. Air is a generic airline, one is a very good set if you have an airline that's not in the database. I've also brought our speed down to 290. Uh, a lot of pilots like to use speed brakes to slow their speed. I'm not a fan of that. As much as possible, I like to use the natural inertia of the airplane. Not only does it provide a smoother ride to the customer, but it's less wasteful of the energy that our engines have produced. Uh, if you need a little speed brake to reduce your speed, it's certainly there for you. But if you have good planning, many times you can get away with just the natural inertia of the aircraft. We're at 2,300 feet per minute descent. Remember, our performance that we told ATC was 1,500. We certainly don't want to uh, be slower than that because they're expecting us to maintain a certain amount of performance. 18,000 feet, we can transition back to our local pressure altitude. I don't know what it is here in Canada, but I do know that back in Portland, look, we're referencing my backup attitude six. So I'm gonna tune in. We had just been given runway 26 left, which is not Expect what we were expecting. Left. So we'll go Air back Fortry. into the arrival page. We will deselect runway 8 right. Now, it's not wasteful that we did that planning. Remember, without the guidance from ATC, we would have to have some guidance beyond PAE. Our flight plan only went to PAE. So 26 left is our assigned runway. I want an ILS. You must here go. Tree. Turn left heading tree tree zero. All that work was Turn not in vain. Heading tree tree zero. US Air Four Tree. discontinuity we want to clean up so I'm going to select this NDXOB in the scratch pad previous page and click it right there we also want to move we have gone beyond pain and our next waypoint is Bezov now again because we're not actually on the planned route the flight computer is keeping our waypoints as if we hadn't flown over them. So we, if we're not actively flying the route, we need to tell the computer to ignore those previous waypoints. So there's Bezov, and it's gonna put us in for a good lining to our new runway 26 left. 
again, we're not flying that, we're flying our vectors. But you can imagine the vectors are going to be pretty close to that planned route because eventually we're both heading to the same place. Okay, I'm going to guess that our next step down altitude is going to be 7,000 feet. I don't know that for sure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in a little mnemonic memory aid. I'm going to dial down to 7,000, but instead of 7,000, I'm going to dial to 7,100. Notice the extra 100 there. And what that tells me is that, that that's not actually an altitude that I've been cleared to, but it's an altitude that I can expect. And if it turns out to be different, then that's fine, but uh, I'll have uh, an idea of where I might be here in the near future. Again, not cleared for it, because that extra 100 reminds me that I'm not cleared for it, but that's what I am going to expect. When we get that, that's going to be below 10,000 feet. We're certainly going to be below 250 on our airspeed strip. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring our speed down to 230. 230, let's take a look at this. Just underneath the landing gear handle, you're going to have some speed references. Uh, if you have the landing gear extended, you can be up to 320 knots. But while the gear is being extended, you shouldn't go faster than 270 knots for fear of damaging the landing gear. More critically than that, if you're here just below that, if you're above 250 knots, you can damage the flaps. We really need flaps for landing, especially notches number one and notches number two. So we, I'm going to set in 230. We're going to use inertia to slow us down. And when we're well below 250, we will start engaging at least our first three levels of flaps. One, two, and three below 250 knots. The fourth notch at 210 and then out come the landing gear. Now the landing gear are more forgiving than the flaps. You know they serve a couple of different purposes. The main purpose is to provide stability and something for the airframe to rest on while the plane's on the ground. But in our situation, they're also going to provide a whole lot of drag. And we'll use that drag in the inertia to get us down as we uh, step down. The air traffic controllers are going to provide us wonderful uh, uh, lateral navigation, left and right, but they're going to provide us only minimal dis, uh, descent altitude uh, coordination and especially speed control. So we need to monitor our vertical speed when we're descending to make sure that we are giving the controller the performance that he wants and especially we're going to need to monitor our speed. Take a look at the top of the speed strip. You see those red lines? Remember that's the never exceed speed and as we slow down and as we add flaps that never exceed bar is going to start to descend. At the same time up from the bottom of the tape will come another strip of red that's the stall speed. Never, never allow your plane to go below st stall speed. And very, very rarely, uh, you know, of course, the, just in the wording, you don't want to exceed the never exceed speed. But the envelope of acceptable speed is going to become smaller and smaller as we continue in the approach. Also, on our approach, you might have noticed as we progress, there's these little, there's a blue oval and a blue line. Now, this is in our planned approach. We're not flying the plan, we're pl flying on vectors. But even though it's not in the plan, when we get close to the, that blue line and that blue oval, that's our missed approach course. That will take US us. Air 4 tree, descend to 7,000 feet, altimeter 29 or decimal 86. Transition level 120. Descend to 7,000 feet. Altimeter 29 or decimal 86. Transition level 120. U.S. Air 4 Tree. 
Boy, today I'm living under a lucky star. 2986, the same pressure setting we had back in Portland. It's exactly what it is here. Don't have to fiddle with it. We guessed 7,000 feet on the descent. That's exactly what we're getting. I'm going to crank our speed down to 230. Again, the limit is 250 at 10,000 feet. In a perfect world, I would like inertia to do most of that, but if it seems like we're not losing enough speed before we get to 10,000, then I will take matters into my own hands and I will add a little speed break. Now, notice our descent at 500 feet per minute. That's not acceptable. Controllers are gonna want you to perform better than that. So I'm gonna kick this up. He's expecting 1,500. I'll just say 1,600 right there. That'll give us more of what he expects. U.S. Air Force Tree, altimeter 29 or decimal 86 hectopascal. Contact Vancouver INTL approach on 125 decimal 200. Expect runway 26 left to land. Bye. Altimeter 29 or decimal 86 hectopascal. Contact Vancouver INTL approach on 125 decimal 200. Runway 26 left to land. Goodbye, U.S. Air Force Tree. Vancouver Approach, good afternoon. U.S. Air Force Tree passing flight level 130, descending 7,000 feet. U.S. Air Force Tree, descend to 7,000 feet, altimeter 29 or decimal 86, transition level 120. Descend to 7,000 feet, altimeter 29 or decimal 86, transition level 120, U.S. Air Force Tree. Remember on our first planned landing, we set up a decision height for Portland Airport? Well, now that we're no longer in Portland, I want to use this Abbey tab, get rid of Portland and put in CYVR. I want to pull up some information from here. I want to look at the field elevation, five feet, and that allows me to set in my decision height. Remember, it's usually, it's on the approach plate, but it's usually 200 feet AGL above the ground. So we want 205. We're gonna use that smaller inner dial and dial this down until it says 205. And also we would want to come up here, if it were dramatically different than Portland, we would want to tell the pressurization system that what our landing altitude would be. In this case, uh, five feet is the same as zero, so we don't have to fiddle with that. Uh, we also want to get our ATIS. Again, listening to two radios at the same time is very common. So we'll have the controller on our number one radio, but we'll have a recorded information at 124.6. On our number two radio, one, U.S. Two. Air Force Tree, turn right heading three five one. Turn right heading three five one, U.S. Air Force Tree. We got the ATIS. We are, we our approach is two six left. U.S. Air Force Tree, turn right heading three five nine er, descend to three thousand feet. Turn right heading 359er, 3,000 feet, U.S. Air Force Tree. Runway 26 left is the ILS Cat 3, which is the best ILS available. Uh, to get Cat, there's Cat 1, 2, and 3. Those are based on the performance, the, the equipment. Your two things are needed to get a Cat 2 or a Cat 3. Better equipment in the airplane and better lighting on the runway. But mostly it's lighting on the runway. 
look at these runway links. 10,000 feet, that is a juicy long runway. We're gonna love that. Here's some weather for us. Overcast at uh, flight level are 2,400, 2,400. Uh, remarks scattered, scattered. Oh, goodness, boy. I used to be able to read those US Air better. 4 tree. <laughs> Turn left heading 29 or 8. Turn left heading 29 or 8. U.S. Air 4 tree. Let's put in our first notch of flaps. Reduce our speed to 190. Let's get our cabin crew picking up all the peanut bags and then they'll get themselves strapped in. This will be the last cabin announcement we make. Air 4 tree, turn left heading 286. Turn left heading 286, US Air 4 tree. I've moved our landing runway, runway 26 left, all the way to the top. So as far as our vectors are concerned, we are, the plan is all the way to the runway and right on to these blue lines, which is our missed approach at Georgia, J-O-R-J-A at 3,000 feet, J-O-R-J-A at 3,000 feet, and then we go into a left hole. So that's our missed approach, should we need it, but right now, our plan is taking us right to the runway threshold. Bring us down to 170 on our speed and another notch of flaps. One fifty on our speed and another notch of flaps. One thing I want to do is to go to menu, FMC, index, approach, and I want to take these numbers, 40 flaps and 139. I want to click that twice, move it into that field, but more importantly, it moved it into my flight display right here at the lower left corner. And I want to have reference to that. Now you could use a, a lower uh, flap setting, but I'm a you know Navy guy, big, don't, uh, don't use more runway than you absolutely need. And the way to avoid that is a higher flap setting, allowing you to land at a slower speed. Cleared to 3,000. 
We have not yet received our one two and seven. Did I put? I may have not. I have not flipped US Air our train. frequencies. Turn left, heading two six four. Cleared for visual approach runway two six left. Contact tower on one two five decibel six five zero when established. Bye. Turn left heading 264. Cleared for visual approach runway 26 left. Contact Fast tower on 125 decimal 650. Goodbye, US Air Fortree. So we've turned on to our final approach heading. You can see our little V-lock bug is coming into place here on the bottom. We are below glide slope. slope bug has not become alive yet. I actually made a little mistake there. I was cleared to 3,000 until established. I probably should have held 3,000. Matter of fact, I'm going to do that. I'm going to... Well, how about 2,300? 1,000 to go. I just want to make sure that we don't descend beyond that capture glide slope. Thousand to go. Thousand to go. I set uh, altitude hold at two thousand. I want to maintain two thousand until. Oh, there comes the. Glide slope alive. I am going to do what I say, don't do what I do. I'm going to go to Command B, both altitudes on, crank down our. If you don't bring down the altitude, you'll be limited to that altitude. So I'm going to allow glide slope capture. The reason I don't use uh, hands-on, you know, my flight instructor used to call it milking the mouse. Um, with an airplane, you want to, I don't want to fall below glide slope, um, pretend like you're milking a mouse. And, and a mouse, you got to get under that mouse and you got to be very gentle, very small little, small little inputs, left, right, up, down. As you're on an approach, as you're flying instruments, milk the mouse, little bitty inputs. And I find with today's joysticks and yokes, you really can't get that sensitivity of control. So you fly a big long flight, you get into, uh, here we are, uh, uh, Pappy, look at the Pappy in the distance, we're getting too white and too red, exactly what you want to see on the Vazi or the Pappy. Uh, we're, uh, our, uh, we're right on where we want to be, fewer lock, glide slope capture. In a little bit, we're going to be in an auto land situation. If I were to fly down to 200 feet and then disengage that, I run the risk of mucking up the whole landing because of my ham-fisted flight. Feet so let's let the auto, auto fly do its job. I know Airbus airplanes are much more into the pilot telling the plane what it want, what he wants, and then the plane giving that pilot, but not necessarily giving him it in the way he wants. The airplane uh, controls the flight services. Boeing approaching uh, two six. Always left. known as a more pilot-friendly airplane. So let's not fail that. Let's use that. I don't know if we're going to get the auto land here. We're getting pretty low. Five hundred too low. Gear. Ah, low. gear. We need gear. We're not going to get an auto land if we don't have gear down.
Okay, no auto land. Two hundred minimums. Continue. Off autopilot. Ooh! Oh, that was nasty. Almost no flare on that one. Reverse thrust. Eighty knots. Well, amazingly, I didn't blow a tire. I do not have my failures turned off. So I could have blown a tire. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to flip over to ground frequency. I'm going to use the overhead view to help me with the taxiing. And we're just going to go to the first open gate that we get to. Again, we took off with the jetway. Ideally, oh, there's one over here on our left. I want to use the jetway. Even default scenery. I think this default scenery is wonderful. Oh, my goodness. We've been assigned gate 16 or stand 16. How convenient, how wonderful. Again, I broke my own rule. I wanted to reach up and kick that APU on so I could get off of engine power and let the folks out as absolutely quick as possible. We're gonna have to work on that, on that for another tutorial. But I feel good about this one. Let's get the chocks under the tires. Terminate flight leg. Set chocks. Seat belts off. Christmas tree off. Jet bridge on the way. Boarding door is going to open on its own, but I want to open up those baggage doors. Oh, well, I can't right now. I don't know why I can't. <laughs> you know, I've actually run into that situation before. Let's uh, get the TCAS turned off. We don't want to radiate anybody over here. Let's also get those pedo probes turned off and I'm not going to clean this up all as much as I would like. Are the doors still locked? They are locked. I, you know, I've even done this where I've cut engine power, it's cut the, cut the engines off, especially on the left hand side. We're off bus. I will hit the battery switch, take us completely off of power. And I, even with that, the door, yeah, the doors are still locked. Well, folks, I don't know how you're getting off the airplane, but that's the end of our flight. Uh, wish it wouldn't have been quite so rough at the end, but hope you enjoyed my very first YouTube tutorial, and I hope that there's something in there that was a benefit, and you might come back for more. Have a good day. Bye.